Let's move on to our next presentation. Uh, we're going to be hearing from our friend Ben, who is going to be telling us a little bit about writing in games, his experience in writing in games, some of the projects he's worked on, and how you can get started. So let's please all give a digital round of applause to our friend Ben. Hey gang, how's it going? Uh, my name's Ben Morgan, and uh, this is my talk on how to improve the writing in your game. First of all, thank you so much to Pig Squad for having me. I'm super excited to be here, so let's get into it. Here's what we're going to cover in the talk today. Uh, we're going to go over my experience so that you understand what context I'm coming from. We're going to talk about who this is for, what do we mean by improving, why is text important in the context of games specifically. We're going to go through some examples, then we're going to talk about drafting, and then we're going to finish by talking about editing. So let's get started. My experience. So me, I've done a lot of different types of writing. I've been a student journalist and an editor, been a poet and a songwriter, been a cultural critic for movies, music, mostly games lately. And for the last seven years professionally, I've been a technical writer of help content. What that means is that for software apps or for like online tools, I'll write the guides for like how to reset your password or how to change your settings and stuff like that. Uh, most importantly, I've been a writer on two games. Uh, the first one is called Escape from Juggalo Mountain. It is a piece of interactive fiction that we made in Twine, and uh, it is about a teenage girl growing up in a separatist society of Juggalos, and that's for free on uh, escapefromjuggalomountain.com. You can check it out. And the other game that just came out last month is called Trash the Planet. That is an incremental resource management game about raccoons who take over the planet and treat it even worse than we do. And you can play that for free at trashtheplanetgame.com. So that's me. And I don't just want to hit you with all my bona fides here. That's not why I'm listing all of this. I just wanted to say that I've written in a lot of different contexts. So this is where I'm coming from. And also I did most of this work before I knew the stuff that I'm going to tell you right now. I learned it along the way. I wish that I had learned it a lot earlier, but I didn't. And I'm sharing this stuff today in part because, you know, I, I just hope that I can improve someone's life by uh, sharing some of these things that have improved mine. All right. So who is this for? Let's talk about that. So anyone who writes or reviews text in a game, uh, the, the idea for this talk came from the fact that uh, most talks that I see about writing for games talk about the process of narrative design, um, which is really important. It's something that I've engaged in. It's something that you got to engage in if you're making a narrative in a game. But text is only a part of that. Text is, is not the whole thing with narrative design. Narrative design covers a lot more parts of the game. So I, I want to specifically zero in on the process of text creation for a game, what text does in a game, and some things that you can do if you're working on text in a game and uh, and you, you feel um, out of your depth or like you want more tips about uh, writing and editing, uh, especially if you're doing it on your own. Uh, this is also for anyone who enjoys thinking about the creative process. I know there are a lot of folks out there who work on a lot of different parts of the game or making games by themselves. I hope that you're able to take something broadly away from this about how I think about the creative process and how you can analyze and improve your own work, even if you're not specifically focusing on writing. And I want to call out that this talk is not for dogs or cats, but they are cuties uh, and other animals too. We don't want to leave them out. I really think it's important to underline that they are cuties. It's important and we should say it. So if you'll permit, I'm just going to take a second to show my beautiful cat Jelly here and I've asked a special guest to come in, give her a smooch. All right, now we can move on. Perfect. So what do we mean by improve? That's kind of a loaded term, right? Uh, it suggests maybe an objective barometer of quality or something like that, but we don't mean that. Quality is subjective. Good writing to one person might be bad writing to another person. So how do we judge whether our writing is good or bad when we're working on it, right? Well, we can say two things. We can say editing is good. Expending effort to, to improve and sharpen our text is always good. You're not wasting time when you're editing your text and you shouldn't be using the first draft of text ever. ever. You can always improve on a first draft. And the other thing is that you need to try to know why you like your text. And that's gonna help and you sharpen it towards your intent, right? Since there's not an objective way to make more quality text, what we need to do is find what subjectively we like about our own text and what, what we wanna do with it, what its intent is in the game, and then we can edit and improve in that direction. So that's what we mean by improve, basically. So now that we've got that down, let's let's think about some text. Let's do a little thought experiment. Let's have some fun with a, um, a notorious bit of text and another version of it and think about why someone might like that, what its intent is and stuff like that. Just get the brain flowing, you know? So 
Uh, this is a line from Castlevania Symphony of the Night for the Sony PlayStation, published by Konami. Uh, and uh, the line by Dracula is, what is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets. I'm sorry I can't do the Dracula voice, but let's think outside of the, the fact that this has been repeated a lot, outside of the memes, let's think about why someone might like this text, right? It's funny and weird. Yeah, that's good. You might like it because of that. It's open to interpretation. It doesn't strictly mean anything because no one quite phrases things like this. So that's something to chew on. It suggests a weird style of speech for Dracula. It, it sort of, in my mind, it sounds like maybe Dracula doesn't talk to a lot of human beings. So he's decided to like, he's just caught bits and pieces. And so he's put together the way that he talks from that. It also sounds good. If you say a miserable little pile of secrets to yourself enough, it's, just, it's a full meal. You can really chew on that sentiment. Let's look at an alternative and see what we could like about that and what happens when uh, when text changes. Uh, so this is from the version of Symphony of the Night that was uh, published on the PSP and the PS4 uh, where the script was updated. Um, and so this is, ha, mankind, a cesspit of hatred and lies. Okay, getting kind of the same sentiment across, but coming from a different angle. So a lot of people don't like this new version because they're used to the old version and it's a lot of fun. But let's think about why someone might like this. Uh, you know, it makes traditional sense. You don't have to read it a lot of times. You don't have to pause on it because it, it makes pretty straightforward sense. Dracula hates mankind because they uh, hate each other and lie a lot. Makes sense. It takes Dracula more seriously, too. So if that's something that you're concerned about with the characterization, this is something that, um, you know, it's not presenting as much of a goofy, over-the-top Dracula as the old line is. So those are some reasons that, that someone could like this new version, too. So there's two versions of text and uh, reasons why we might like one version over the other, just so we're starting to think about analyzing text in a game a little bit. And let's pause here and talk a little bit about why text is important in the context of the game. What does text provide, right? Well, it provides information overall, you know, whether that's about the rules, and systems of the game or about the game's world or about the game's characters, text is always providing the player with more information. And that could be narrative, tone, humor, lore, anything like that, big and small. There's lots of different things that text can do in a game. So why should we spend time on text? Well, I've already said it just does a lot of stuff for you. So, you know, it is worth focus, but you want to spend time on text for the same reason you want to spend time on any part of your game. It's allowing you control of the player's experience, right? So if you're not spending time on the text, if you're using first drafts, if you're not thinking about what the text is doing or what your intent is with it, you're losing that control of the experience. The text is going to have an impact on the player, whether you plan it or not. So you should plan it. You should get that extra juice from, from focusing on that and sharpening that intent there. And you can't guarantee reception or engagement with text, right? Players can skip through the text usually, and that's totally fine. Players can also, you know, mute uh, the game and not hear any of the sound effects or the, the, uh, the score but that doesn't mean that you don't focus on those, right? So, um, you know, text is worth focusing on is my point here. Let's look at some examples and get a little bit more in depth here uh, and uh, call out some specific types of text that you're going to see in games and think about what questions we could ask ourselves to sharpen those and improve it. Let's start with dialogue. So when you're writing dialogue between any number of characters, what you want to ask yourself to get to the intent of that and to sharpen that is what are your characters' backgrounds and motivation and what's their role in the narrative and how does the audience perceive them? So to understand why your characters are doing things, you have to understand their backgrounds and their motivation. That's pretty standard for dialogue writing for really any type of um, creative work. And then for their role in the narrative and the audience perception, that's important for you know, playing with the audience's perception. You can lean into uh, the role that the character plays uh, for drama, or you can lean away from it for surprise or humor. You know, there's a lot of option there and you wanna, uh, you wanna know where you're coming from. So let's look at some dialogue examples. This first one is from an SNES RPG called Lufia 2, Rise of the Sinistrals. This, uh, this NPC is saying, no matter what I wish for, my job won't ever be fun. I think I'll just take the day off. And uh, I just really like this sentiment. It resonated with me, so I took a screenshot of it. It's, uh, it's a little bit more of a uh, little story than you get from NPC dialogue in old RPGs. I like it. This is from a favorite indie of mine in recent years, Wide Ocean Big Jacket. Uh, this is a character named Ben, which I relate to because that's my name. And I also relate to this because I uh, also am maybe freaking out a little bit at uh, times in my life. Uh, not right now, though. I'm having a lot of fun. 
Uh, let's talk about educational text next, which is like tutorials, tool tips. So we can ask ourselves two questions here as well. What does the player need to understand first? So with educational text, order of operations is really important, especially with complex subjects. You need to put the basic stuff first and then build up to the more complex stuff so that players understand um, what's going on, basically. You can lose someone if you go too deep on complexity too quickly. So order is important. And then what are all the elements in the game called and do those make sense? And this might sound a little nitpicky, but I, I do think every element in your game needs to have a name and it needs to make sense if you want the player to make sense of it. And it's important to have this. Now, when, when we're sharpening and refining text, we're not always sharpening and refining towards clarity. So in this instance, I'll say, if you want part of your game to not make natural sense to unnerve or confuse the player, that's legitimate. And you can improve text in that direction too. You know, There's a spectrum there and you can play with it, um, but you need to know what you're doing there. And you need to be able to answer this question clearly so you can understand what your text should be like and if it's achieving that. So let's look at some examples of educational text. First, here's this really simple one from Castlevania Harmony of Dissonance. This is a ring called Satan's Ring. And it's called that because Satan himself once wore this ring. Really straightforward. Couldn't be plainer than that. And then on the other end, here's something that's a lot more complex. This is a tutorial page from Trails in the Sky first chapter, um, which is a JRPG. And it's explaining how the magic system works in this game, where you put these uh, orbs of different elements on this line and the way they line up and connect to each other controls what magic spells you're able to cast basically and so this is going paragraph by paragraph referring to a diagram to go into a lot more complexity and this is what i was talking about earlier with order of operations you know it's first telling you that the orbit slots one through six are connected by lines which stand out from the central slot and then it's going on to explain the rest of the thing i'm not going to read the whole thing to you um, but play the game it's a very good game um, let's talk about diegetic text, uh, finally, which is narration, books, stuff like that. Diegetic is sort of a fancy $10 word for uh, text which is real in the fiction of your game, right? So... Um, someone telling the story of your game who exists in the game, um, books, newspapers, things like that. And so with diegetic text, the questions we wanna ask ourselves are, in what context is the player encountering this? Have you told them anything about the narrator or about the book or newspaper they're encountering? outside of the text itself? If so, you won't have to include as much informational stuff in the diegetic text itself. But if you haven't told them anything, they're coming to it fresh without any expectation, that's something that you wanna consider. Um, and you also wanna think about who wrote this diegetic text in your world and what does their voice sound like, right? So let's use a newspaper as an example. Some newspapers take themselves very seriously. They wanna appear very impartial and that's one way of writing and other newspapers wanna be a lot more salacious and they wanna hit a point over and over and over again to get a across very bluntly and that's another way of doing it and you need to know you know what your newspaper is like in your fictional world and why so let's look at some examples of diegetic text this is uh from dragon quest builders 2 this is a letter from uh someone you've left on a previous island in the game who's uh sending you a letter to update you on what's going on and then here's another one. This is from Resident Evil, which is a series that absolutely loves diegetic text, especially when someone is infected and they want to show them sort of degrading by the quality of their text degrading too. This is one of my favorite entries. People might know this one. Uh, it's from The Keeper's Diary. This is from the remake of Resident Evil. And uh, it says, fever gone, but itchy. Today hungry and eat doggy food. We were talking earlier about text that sounds good, right? Um, Nothing sounds better to me than uh, today hungry and eat doggy food. Incredible. Very good stuff. So those are some examples of types of text in a game. Let's move on to talking about drafting, right? The process of writing. So here are some, I'm going to run through some, basically some tips and some things to think about when you're drafting to help improve that experience for you. And then we're going to talk about some specific tools that you can use. So first consider where you're writing, right? And by this, I don't mean physical location, although we will talk about that in a second. By this, I mean, don't write the text for your game in the program that you're using to make your game. Cause that program was probably not built for drafting text, write the text for your game in a program that was built for drafting text so that you have more support when you're editing the text. 
uh, and uh, when you're, you know, updating it and all of that, and once the text is close to finished, that's when I would put it in the game. You can disagree with me. Um, you cannot do this. If you have a workflow that works for you, you know, don't, don't interrupt your creative process. Don't stop what works for you. But in my experience, you're going to save yourself a lot of hassle by writing and sharpening your text in a program built for that and then moving it into the game. Um, as you're drafting, you know, it can be difficult to write. Some writers have kind of like a love-hate relationship with writing itself, and that's certainly me. Some things you can do to get yourself drafting or to set word counts or timers, things like that, to give yourself a goal or give yourself a time limit uh, that gets you going. Timers have been working really well for me lately. I've started using the Pomodoro method, which is like 25 minutes writing focused five minutes rest and then back to 25 minutes it really just like that that started the 25 minutes is kind of like a starting gun for me and gets me going so experiment with things to see what motivates you to get through that writing process and a big thing is you got to get that blank page out of here you got to destroy it you got to blast it off the surface of the earth the blank page is the enemy and you got to eliminate it i can't tell you how many times i've been stuck on a blank page and then open a new tab so i don't have to look at it because it's really intimidating right and so what you want to do to get rid of that is just jump in the pool man just like draft as quickly as possible even if it's not making sense you know you're going to edit your text right we're not using first drafts right we've agreed on that so if you're going to edit your text it doesn't matter what it looks like to start with as long as you're getting something from out of your brain onto the page so you're not looking at that blank page and to tie into that find what helps you get into that space to write get into that mood to jump into the pool of the blank page for me it's either coffee in the morning or anxiety at midnight these are big things that fuel me when i'm listening to, to music while i'm writing i love to listen to daft punk's live album uh, alive 2007 because it just has like this constant beat that keeps me going but i'll listen to different music if i'm writing different characters or writing different scenarios or things like that and maybe location helps you. I don't mind writing in the same spot. Some, some people like to change spots, write outside, write in coffee shops. I know that's been kind of constrained lately, but maybe there's like another location in your house or maybe you have a porch or something like that. You know, consider what motivates you is what I'm saying. And practice. This is the hardest part. So I want to pause on this for a second. My whole life, people told me, you know, if you want to get better at anything, but if you want to specifically get better at writing, you need to practice. You need to write every day. You need to figure out how to do that. And I had a really hard time setting that up. I was like, what? But I'm not, if I'm not actively, if I don't have an idea for something, what am I supposed to be writing? Like I, I, I had no success with like journaling or anything like that. I couldn't figure it out. Finally, I, I got a job as a technical writer and I had to write every day, even if I didn't like it. And the stuff I was writing was really boring, but it made me a much better writer year over year, forcing myself to write. That practice just ingrains a lot of automatic behavior in you that can be really really helpful and so i'm not suggesting that everyone who wants to get practice writing get a job as a technical writer that's really impractical what i'm saying is find some practice for you that works try anything try anything that's going to get you writing as often as possible I don't even think that you should write every day necessarily. Like I said, that was intimidating for me. But find a process where you, is it, whether it's journaling or keeping a blog or um, anything like that, writing down your dreams or anything like that, the only thing I'm going to suggest is that you also edit the text. And I know that that's challenging, but you know writing is rewriting is a common saying and that's just it's just true you need as much practice editing as you get writing so if you're just writing and not editing you're you're not learning the second half of that process you're not learning to sharpen that text so that's what i'll say about practice let's look at some drafting tools now so a drafting tool that's going to be useful is just whatever helps you write right whatever's not getting in the way so you can use a word processor like google docs you can use something targeted to writers like scrivener that costs money though uh just so you know and uh or you could use something really simple like notepad you could use handwriting if that's what gets you going so i use google docs because i just think of it as default i've worked in it for a really long time and it's comfortable to me but if i get stuck or intimidated by a piece of text that i'm working with i will move it over into notepad uh, or text edit and mac just a blank like little window of uh of text and that is less intimidating to me and i can kind of get outside of the problem and, and rewrite it and and try it in a different environment and that kind of helps me get unstuck so consider that you can use multiple programs when you're drafting as well um, now let's talk about editing 
So with editing, you're either going to need to find an editor or learn to edit yourself. And there are challenges with both. If you're finding an editor, you need to find someone you trust, hopefully someone who's working on the project with you. But if not, someone who you who can come into the project and you can explain to them what's going on and and what the intent of the text is so they can edit correctly. Or, you know, if you're learning to edit yourself, like I said, you'll have to set it up as a practice and you'll have to be patient with yourself as you learn to improve there and find tactics for getting outside of the text so that you can see it as an editor instead of as a writer. And we're going to go over some of those in just a second. Um, but one thing I'm going to suggest either way is that you write a style guide to help define what you want. And I know that sounds a little strict and a little intimidating. Um, but all that you need to make one of these are the answers to the questions that I talked about earlier. So when we were talking about dialogue and educational text and diegetic text and asking those questions to understand what we want out of it, you just need to write down the answers to those questions like what are my character's motivations? What are they like? How do they speak? Do they break any rules of grammar when they speak? Uh, things like that. Or, you know, what is the author of this book in my world uh, like? What are the names of all the elements in my game? Things like that. Once you write that stuff down you've got a style guide boom no problem uh, and you can use that when someone comes in as an editor to say hey this these are the rules this is what you should be judging this work against if you don't do that you're going to get a really unequal more like personally biased version of editing that's not as helpful everyone needs to agree on the standard that they're editing towards and this is important even if you're editing by yourself because you're not going to be a consistent editor without rules to to guide yourself without guardrails right um, cool. So let's talk about some editing tools. Now, these are all for the process of self-editing, which I think a lot of people have to deal with, right? It's not always easy to find someone who's willing to like comb over text, especially for larger projects or maybe solo devs or anything like that. There are a lot of situations you can get into where you're just editing by yourself. So a useful editing tool is anything that allows you to step outside of the text and see it in a new light, right? So there's some techniques for that. The most useful one is spending time away from the text, simple time, right? Uh, and uh, that can be a couple of hours or ideally like a day, right? Um, when you come back to the text. And the purpose of this is just that if you've just written the text, you've got it ingrained in your head a little bit and it can be tough to find stuff that sounds weird or that's running on too long because you just wrote it, right? You, you took a thing out of your brain and tried to make it make sense on the page. So to you, it just looks like, well, yeah, that was the thing that was in my brain, right? So you need to spend some time away from it to come back and see it with fresh eyes. Um, the other thing that's really useful is reading out loud. And I would really recommend you not ever publish anything that you haven't read out out loud to yourself because the process of reading something out loud is so much different than the process of reading in our head. It can help you catch so much awkward phrasing, uh, run on sentences or sentences without enough support where maybe you like your thought jumped for a second and when you read it, you don't catch it. But yeah, reading out loud is incredibly helpful and also completely free. Um, the tools that I would suggest are uh, Hemingway, which is a free web app, and you can see that in the picture here. That'll highlight text for you and give you another set of eyes on it, even if it is a program's eyes. So here, yellow and red are complex sentences, green is passive voice, and blue are um, adjectives uh, that you might want to think about removing. But you don't have to take any of the suggestions from this tool. I don't always uh, do what it tells me to do. I don't think that's a, that's a helpful way to use it. Just use it as a way to look at your text. like. I said through a different set of eyes and try to get outside of it and think about how other people might be encountering it there's another tool called grammarly that does the same thing that's a little bit more advanced and can be really helpful if you struggle with grammar i struggle with grammar uh, sometimes especially the advanced stuff uh, commas are tough for me for whatever reason so grammarly can be really helpful just be warned that it has a free and a paid version and the uh, the free version is really aggressive about recommending the paid version to you so keep that in mind uh, so those are some editing tools to help you out and that's the whole thing. So just thank you so much for your time. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks to Pig Squad for having me. This was so much fun. Um, and I just want to say, please go make things. I think the most incredible and exciting thing that we can do and why Pig Squad is so cool is just making things and, and sharing things with each other. You know, it's a version of sharing ourselves with each other. And I think it's incredible. Um, so please go and make something. I hope you got at least one thing out of this that's going to help you um, as you're continuing to create things. And I just want to say, I think you're doing a great job and I hope you have a wonderful night. All right. Peace. All right. Thank you so much, Ben. That was great. Um, 
yeah, a, uh, a ton of useful information there. Oh my gosh. Uh, thank you so much for all the tools and everything and everybody saying you're a great speaker. I know that uh, you, don't, you don't do a lot of presentations like this, but you're a great speaker. Uh, we had a couple of questions in the audience come in right at the very end, some fun ones. Um, one question was uh, some of the favorite, uh, some of Ben's favorite bad dialogue in a video game. Uh, the useless uh, Satan's Ring dialogue was Ben's answer. Uh, absolutely hilarious. Very, very good. Um, another question that we had was when you're, what, a lot of people, it really seemed to resonate with them that spending time away from your text and coming back to it, uh, that concept of, I wrote it on the page, it makes sense to me, but being able to think, okay, wait, how does it make sense to someone else uh, is so important. And Ben recommended coming away from your text and then coming back to it to t try to simulate that for yourself. Uh, one question was just like, how to spend that time away? I know that when I do stuff, uh, when I try to come back to something, I sometimes I get really busy when I'm away and sometimes I, am, uh, I, I try to keep my head clear when I'm doing that. Um, and he said that uh, he said that it's it's typical that uh, our brains automatically process stuff as we're doing other things. So having new ideas when you return by being inspired by new things, if you uh, come away from your text and want to look at uh, a, a new way of thinking about things, is usually a good way to do it. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I think this uh, uh, somebody else in chat is also saying that this is a great talk to uh, uh, resonate with any kind of creative topic, and I think that's kind of par for the course for all of our talent talks. It's really cool to hear everybody talk about these things. And uh, the uh, it's, it's it's pretty clear that a lot of these processes are, are really helpful when you're soloing, when you're with a team, when you're doing art, when you're doing programming, like anything. So uh, yeah, if you're if you're not particularly uh, looking into writing in uh, the near future or anytime soon, think about how this might apply to other things that you're working on. Uh, 